it. Here we are. <laughs> Amazing times. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I think would be important for our listeners is to understand a little bit about the backstory of Fantasy of Flight. If you can well, give us some insight. Yeah, you know. I've always been fascinated by flight. I had a short story. I had a museum in Miami. I was open there, uh, started in 1985. Quickly, I grew the facility, realized I needed to be where Central Florida tourism was because the people were here. I got led up here, build Fantasy of Flight. Um, we were open for 18 and a half years and wow. kind of realized it was very limited to be the airplane museum enthusiast crowd. Mm -hmm. And uh, over that period of time, I realized there was a potential of doing something even grander. And uh, it, it was over about that 15 year period where I understood what that was. So after I closed the facility, you know, I met Bob uh, Ward here, and uh, Bob was actually at my grand opening party. Oh, I, I didn't heard realize about that it. Party too. In 1990. That was a real party, I heard. The facility you are now in is our first attempt and is only a preview of what's to come. I hope that you will all be touched on your journeys by the fantasy of flight. Thank you all for coming. Please enjoy the evening. All right. Thank you all. Open the doors. A long time dear friend of mine, Pat McBride, helped Kermit launch his, his first effort. Did the design here for this. Yes, exactly. Okay, right, right, right. And uh, so anyway, so then Bob introduced me to you, and uh, since then we've been, uh, you know, kind of working on this path of trying to uh, understand what my vision is, and, and I, I think everybody's, uh, you know, come from the, the current, uh, you know, not rut of the existing industry, but yeah. basically the current mindset. The current groove that's yeah. been defined. And, and this is really way outside that, and I, and I think everybody's embraced the concept. It's new, it's fresh, and I think it's got purpose and meaning, which is really pretty cool. And, and I kind of, the thing that I really like is, you know, a lot of the existing industry is about making change. I'm rubbing my fingers together for the viewers. But <laughs> right. Fantasy of Flight is about making change, and I'm, yeah. Put my hands, yes. you know, with, from, within. You, within. Right. And so one of the things that happened was prior to opening here, I always knew for about five years there was something I was supposed to say on the wall. I intuitively sensed it, but I couldn't figure it out. I tried a couple of times to do the creative process, and it was like the energy wasn't there. The door was closed. Mm -hmm. And I, and not that I gave up and I didn't forget about it, but three months literally we were getting ready to open. Three months before we opened Fantasy of Flight, this was downloaded to me in a dream. Really? I woke up, middle yeah. of the night, three o'clock in the morning, wrote, wrote it, it down, down, sent it down to Pat and the guys in Miami, and they said, hey, hey, we'll put it on the wall out there. And uh, sure enough, it went there, and I didn't realize till much later that what was embedded in that, in the long run, was our mission statement, which is to light that spark within. And it took me a while to understand exactly what that was. There's a whole kind of a woo-woo metaphysical side to me. People know me for airplanes, but yes. uh, I think that's the least they're gonna remember me for. But what I finally understood was, um, what's been shown to me is everything at its core level is basically infinite potential. And when infinite potential enters this reality, which is created with light, that's in effect the metaphor of what you truly are bringing infinite potential coming into this world of light and you expressing it into this world in your own unique way. That's what Fantasy of Flight's about. I want people to come here through a theme park concept and an environment where they literally self-discover and self-transform themselves for themselves. That was one of the most exciting parts and one of the reasons I felt this was an important podcast is it's oftentimes uh, more a retrospective uh, mm -hmm. exposure to those listeners, but to be able to see the journey of something that is so unique. I mean, for us, we were definitely bumped off center. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we're, we feel very confident in understanding the metrics of doing destination experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one of the reasons Bob had invited us yeah, to participate sure. because, you know, ultimately this will be a destination for guests to experience. But the subject matter, the content, the richness, the altruistic nature of this thing is so fresh and unique. And to me that I feel this is a great opportunity for people to see this is something that's gonna be epic when this opens, in my I, mind's eye. I think so too. I think initially people are gonna go, 
what exactly is this? It's so unique. And one of the difficult things is, but I think in the long run it's going to play into our, our benefit, is that it's hard to describe exactly what it is. And I think our marketing plan in the future is going to be you're not going to know what it is until you go there. And then when you go there, you're going to go, oh my God, this is such a cool thing. And then you can't explain it to somebody and you're going to say, you got to go there to understand what it is. And I feel like it's, once it opens, it's going to be, oh my gosh, of course. Yeah, I agree. It's like breathing. This should have been here all this time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's something that's hard to describe now because it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. But once it's done, it's going to be, of course, this yeah. has to happen. This is, should, this is how it should be. Yeah, right? it, it's gonna be it's gonna be really neat. I mean, we you know we're starting off small. We're we're only looking for what less than three hundred thousand people a year to come through. Is kind of what we're designing for, and and it's really to kind of take uh, you know the museum I had in Miami. We call Act One. All great stories come in three acts. Okay. Mm -hmm, yes. And so basically, Act One was uh, the Weeks Air Museum. We opened in nineteen eighty five. It closed with Hurricane Andrew, rolled through Miami and devastated my place. Uh, I moved up to Central Florida. That was the beginning of Act Two. We opened in 1995, and we closed the doors, I think, in 2012 to focus on what yes, I'm man. saying, you know, go get a hot dog and a Coke. Act Three is about to begin, you know, and, that, and that's where you guys that's came in, so I right. appreciate your help. Well, let's come, go on inside. Yeah, it'd be and, uh, great to, to kind of walk and talk through some of the environments that you have here. Yeah, so basically this was, uh, just came in the entrance door from where the sign was, and we had a little reception counter. We had a restaurant here that originally was just supposed to be just a little bar and grill kind of a thing. And it was so elegantly designed, I felt it needed a higher uh, name for it, you know, and because we had a basically a Compass Rose in the middle thing, we call it the Compass Rose Restaurant. Um, this actually, in the long run, this whole facility that was open during Act Two, uh, believe it or not, was initially only ever designed to be my shop for the restoration and maintenance yeah. of what's the largest private collection of old airplanes on the planet. Nobody comes close. Between my collection of about 140 airplanes and a not-for-profit that's got about a couple of dozen, you know, there's like over that's 165 incredible. airplanes. They're not all flying or put together, a lot of projects. But uh, I realized early on that part of the reason why I've collected this is I think what we're going to create here stands apart from the existing industry, which is, you know, it's about having fun, escaping from reality. And, you know, Walt Disney had a great segue coming out of World War II and Korea. People wanted to forget all that stuff. He, crea he created something that allowed people to, to have fun and, and do that. You know, everything had changed at the end of the war. You know, the women were now in the workforce. You know, everybody had 2.3 kids, and we drove across the, you know, great interstate system, and, yeah. and it was leave it to beaver time, you know? Right, right. And, and it was a great segue for Walt. And I think uh, what I want to do is, I, I really have no interest in being in the museum business per se, you know, the airplane museum yeah, business. Right. It's too limited and I quite frankly lost my butt over decades. And then uh, <laughs> from a business, model from a business oh point gosh. of view, I mean, we, we made a difference touching people in ways, but it was not efficient and effective mm -hmm. uh, to a broader crowd. And then the existing theme park industry um, is fun, engaging. You know, my uh, my wife and my daughter have annual passes at some of the local big ones. You right, know, right, right. and I and I, I appreciate everything that you know Bob did with Universal Studios, and Walt's a big hero of mine. I've read a lot about Walt uh, Disney over the years, and uh, but I realize that there's I don't I don't in and of itself don't have an interest in that business, but I realize I think the industry, if it's delivered in the proper way, it's it still uses. The, the the metrics, the and, metrics yeah, and everything right because you know from my perspective Walt stood on the shoulders of the previous industry which was amusement parks yes the amusement park industry was a fixed space standing on the shoulders of the previous industry which was the traveling Tra circus, traveling circus right. and they you know and the traveling gypsy bands kind of got ringling and barnum together you know to right, create right, something right and and make it a little bit more exciting and bigger and grander and so it's like what can who can come along and what concept can come along that stands on Walt's shoulders, mm -hmm. or the existing industry's shoulders? And so, you know, I mean, we're going to make a little stab at it, see what we can do. Yeah. And uh, it uses a lot of the existing industry with the theming, the characters, the, the immersive environments, yeah, right. the ride technology. Mm -hmm. But but I think the big key thing here is, and the difference of what we want to create is, it's not about delivering rides that are just themed under an intellectual property. It's about creating experiences that are common to the human uh, uh, experience 
but everyone sees it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so the way we deliver it through the way we deliver our story and our entertainment, there's ride technology to deliver it, but it's not a ride, it's an experience. No, no it's ubiquitous to the consumer. It's intended to let the story drive mm -hmm. it, and there's a motivation for opening up the minds of those who engage Absolutely, with it. and so when people literally come to Fantasy of Flight, we don't tell them anything. Everything we focus on is common to the human experience. There's no value system attached to it. And they basically, the way we deliver the entertainment, they can't not reflect on where they've come from, where they're at, and where they're going. And so it's their internal process that is their own self-discovery and potentially self-transforming process. So that's kind of what I want to do. Incredible. If we could deliver, I think we're on to something big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll deliver. Uh, yeah, well, oh, yeah, you'll deliver. Kermit also has this great saying, too, that expresses that in a nutshell, which is, it's really about that which draws us beyond what we think we are. Yes, right. To be more of who we really are. Truly are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. truly. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, and from, that's, that, that, that's very inspirational and it's aspirational as mm -hmm. well. You're right. I, I know, remember, I remember, Bob, you, you mentioning Kermit the first time saying you, you were going to elevate our brand and, and, uh, and see if Kermit would uh, embrace us as a, as a group. And you were talking a little bit about your first meeting at SAIT, how there was this kind of um, totally total synchronistic draw that you know, happened. Totally meant to be. Um, yeah, one of those great moments uh, where you're across the room and all of a sudden there's a, a gap in people and there's a lot of buzzing going on. Yeah, and, and everything you, you, kind you, of fades you, away. I, could, but I saw the light coming down <laughs> and the angels singing. <laughs> but it, it, it truly was, you know, because there, there is so much to us than what we give ourselves credit for or embrace mm -hmm. in what we have within us. Yeah. And, but we all have those moments and each of us in different ways where no doubt. we've experienced that with someone else. Yeah, and sure. in this particular case, there, there is such a like-mindedness about it all. It wasn't a peripheral, peripheral moment. No. It was like it was a, a literal... very targeted moment. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and so. uh, here we are today. And, and I knew as we started talking about resources that this is going to require uh, a very special resource to help us in the creative, imaginative development of Kermit's vision. And Cecil, I have to say that you and Falcons represent that. We were fortunate to work together at Universal, and, but you're very much a Renaissance man as, as Kermit and I am. And I believe to look at some reference point, the Renaissance is a time where you were multi-talented, multi-crafted, thought in many different ways, all toward a big idea. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're about too. We're not just doing the next big thing of what already exists. It exists, exactly. That's not it. Yeah. No. We're, it's we're doing what that's doesn't never exist. been done before. And yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to find really, and there's a lot of talent, but it's hard for them to make the leap outside the box, yeah. you know, yeah. so to speak. And, and you embrace that, and even more so, you have personally put together a team at Falcons that share that same insightfulness and vision and passion and you know it was it was easy and now that we've been <laughs> together for several years yeah. exploring ideas um, it's really exciting where it's about to, to go yeah there, there was no idea in my mind after meeting you guys a couple of times that you were the you guys were the right choice and you know, not only led by Cecil but everybody I've had out here the vision tour and everybody you know from my understanding you know wants to be on the project oh, they're excited about it's it. unbelievable if everyone could participate they would everyone is so inspired by this project and they want to be a participant in helping it get realized I mean there is true passion in the firm it's unbelievable yeah well I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that uh, uh, you know, we're working together and right now we're basically at the point to where we've kind of done the 30,000 foot view. We've pretty much got a, a pretty good footprint of what we're going to actually uh, build probably. I think there's going to be a little bit of tweak in there. Mm -hmm, we've got our mm -hmm. list of attraction elements that uh, we're going to deliver and we've got them all listed and we're kind of diving in a little deeper with, you know, space requirements and, you know, where you put the bathrooms and maintenance closets yeah. and back All the, the back logistical sides are coming into play. But for me, it was a, an interesting journey. And I think I learned a lot about how to 
look at the traditional metrics that you know you and I have been involved with right. um, uh, from the be beginning. And obviously, Bob, you were my mentor at Universal, so yeah. I learned a lot from you and understanding how to take a vision and make it reality with the you know the the challenges of having so many people per hour, et cetera, the capacities, logic, hierarchy of architecture, uh, emotional arc of the story. So all those things are still relevant here, yeah. mm -hmm. but what's interesting to me is that I've, I've never looked at a program like this that is um, such a VVIP type of scenario where I have to constantly um, rethink my own mode of operandi mm -hmm. when it comes to problem solving because I tend to um, fall back on some of the exactly. traditional metrics. Yeah. And so it's opened up and it's benefited not only fantasy flight, but my own personal growth. Um, but to be able to look at this so uniquely in that way of how guests will engage with this, it is truly an experience that people will never have a queue line. I mean, just the thought of not having to entertain someone in a queue is a different shift of thought because it's going to be so perfectly synchronized to the capacity that everyone's going to have enough content to engage with that is queueless. I mean, yeah. these are things that are like, our listeners are going to go, what? How? How are you going to, what? I don't understand yeah. it. Because it's going to take a vision tour for all our listeners to understand the profound nature of how we're changing the yeah. process a little bit here. And, and I think, I, I think, you know, one of the things we're wor worried about a little bit, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but it's like, what's our, our clientele, you know? And it's kind of like the people that, I mean, I was a seminar junkie for a long time and I've done stuff with Chopra and Tony Robbins and, you know, Covey and stuff like that, right, you right, know? And, yeah. and I mean, you know, those people are serious about their journeys. They want to learn things. They want to expose themselves to things. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's not going to be at that level of cost, but, um, it, it's but that good. is like the audience that yeah. will embrace this and understand it and get it. But ultimately, I think Initially. that might be the initial yes. target. But, but the reality yeah. is everyone deserves to have this experience. <laughs> Ab absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I, I think it was interesting, too, you know, when we first kind of started this, uh, because I'm not in the design. You guys came from this background. Yeah. And I think there was a little bit, I mean, my advantage in joining you guys is you guys understand the metrics, the delivery, how to do, you know, where the, all that kind of stuff, you know. And I tend to be more of a, just a creative kind of guy. You guys are as well, but you understand the, the logistics of, ma mm -hmm. of pulling it off and actually not having to lose its butt, you know, which, right. I, which I did in the last two rounds. Right, right. And so, uh, so in some ways that was a benefit to me because I didn't have that baggage, so to speak, from the existing design paradigm. Right, right, right. And right. so I came and I said, well, what if we did this? And what if we did this? And what yeah, if we did this? Yeah, why can't we do this? Yeah, and so, and so I came to this and I, and I remember early on, you all are looking at me like, well, you know, this and that. And it took a while, you know, to kind of, I'm not saying train you guys, but at least to get you to <laughs> no, come around bump to my... Off, bump, off, bump us off center. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You had it, we had a groove and, and you know, obviously, We've been, you know, embraced because of our efficiency and logistics, yeah. right? Yeah. So typically our client base rewards us for, you know, getting to the brass tacks of effectiveness and efficiency and, and embraces that. But in reality for this scenario, it would limit the vision, right? Yeah. To, to yeah. have those things in play. So it was a free flowing process, even within the process. Yes, exactly. Right? You know, one of the things I said, very early on, and I, I think you both would support this at this point, is that, you know, we're trying to design something to get people, we're trying to bump people off center. In fact, I, I came up with a design mission. And uh, and I, I, I and asked. And it's always in front of every everything deliverable we do. we've it done. It has to go through that. We read it again every time we ideate. And and, and I was <laughs> at, uh, at one of the local 800 pound gorilla parks here eating lunch with the guy that was running the design aspect mm -hmm. and they didn't have a design mission i was very surprised so so anyway so so it's it's a filter with which we run everything through it was kind of given to me there's kind of a woo-woo side to me and i connect uh with i let's just say my friends at this point and uh and it's interesting i i actually um 
I'm not going to go there at this point. That'll be another podcast. <laughs> That'll be another series. That's awesome. But, uh, but basically, this is very, very exciting. And where I was going with all that was, you know, I told everybody, our purpose here is to create an opportunity. We're not here to change and save the world. But through what I think we're going to create, we're going to deliver the tools with which the world can change and save itself. Right. And so it's a completely like different perspective. So we're only here to be Johnny Appleseed to throw seeds out on the ground. And if the ground's fertile and whichever seed each person picks up in their own way, they self-discover themselves. And, you know, I explained we're here to bump people off center and have them see their own perspective right. and, and like what Bob said with kind of one of the definition of fantasy of flight, fantasy of flight is that which leads us beyond what we think we are to become more what we truly are and what we truly are is infinite potential. We all have potential to go beyond ourselves. The human experience is basically four elements, body, mind, heart, and spirit. And at any point on anybody's journey, we each have an opportunity to go beyond ourselves in, in that aspect. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair, you're a quadriplegic or whatever, whatever. And, you know, even the fact physically I, I'm intact, you know, maybe mentally and spiritually and emotionally, I still have some things to work yeah, on. Yeah, challenge, know? right. So, but this will allow that opportunity for those who engage with fantasy flight to be able to see their own potential and how it's even beyond what they can envision. Yeah, a lot of designers are gonna be listening to this. And when you go through the creative process, I mean, we use the phrase here, throwing spaghetti on the wall. And like, if you go to mm -hmm. write a book, you know, you just start throwing spaghetti on the wall and you stand back and look at it and go, well, this needs to be in the beginning. This needs to be at the end. And if you follow the energies of that, it creates itself, okay? And mm -hmm. I think that's it the way- It unfolds. It unfolds. I remember we- you. When we first met, we, we talked about that, and I used the analogy of Michelangelo finding, uh, you know, a stone, and as he chipped away at it, he, he, it's already there. Yeah. In his mind, it's some parts are softer and some parts are harder, and I would just chip away, and it wouldn't that naturally come out, right? It, was, it wasn't like he was sculpting it, right. he was revealing it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so your creative journey as you talk about writing a book, Spaghetti on the Wall, you're following those energies as if it was kind of there written, but you are now just going through the journey of letting it unveil itself. Exactly. Right? Because I think at some level, it already exists in another reality. Mm -hmm. It's just our job to bring it into this five cents one that we right, experience. Right. So. Again, that's a whole nother podcast yeah, right. that we yeah, could yeah, talk yeah, about. Yeah. I think at this point, uh, it, it would be good to explain Fantasy of Flight. And when we were coming up with the, the name, you know, we threw spaghetti on the wall. And basically, mm -hmm. we were throwing words up there like museum and aircraft and collection and greatest and worlds and, you know, flight and all that kind of stuff. And there was a book on the shelf. I, I flew on the U.S. aerobatic team for like 15 years uh, in airplanes I designed and built myself. Oh, that yeah. was another life. And basically, uh, there was a book on the shelf called Flight Fantastic. And uh, somebody at the time actually coined fantasy of flight. And it's like you, 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 when you resonate with something, it's almost like, you know, you just, whoosh, my focus went right there and I knew exactly that was the name. I fought tooth and nail with the design people. Like, what does fantasy of flight mean? Because most of the airplanes I had at the time were like warbirds from World War II, you know? Right. So if, they had a preconceived idea of what you had as assets. Yeah, in a traditional but, design. Even, but even I couldn't explain what fantasy of flight was, but I, Not yet. I chose it. I chose it. And what <laughs> I discovered was, is this concept of flight, because I have a fascination with not only physical flight, but inner flight as well. There's a whole woo -woo and there's a side to me. Why. <laughs> and so, so, what, so what I realized was flight, I defy you to find a more profound metaphor than flight for pushing our boundaries, reaching beyond ourselves, and freedom. You can't. And in the physical worlds, everyone can relate to reaching for the sky, reaching for the stars. Right, right. That has nothing it's... to do with airplanes, has nothing to do with air aircraft, but within us, we soar in our imagination, fly in our dreams, which has nothing to do with airplanes. So it's really more, it's about, it's the metaphor of flight of the human spirit is mm -hmm. what fantasy of flight's about. Right. And, and the, but they may not get that initially because you do have also, airplanes as a draw. But no, right? but, I mean, so well, it's actually, interesting. Yeah, but let me, me. Let, let me correct that because, because basically in the past, the airplanes were perceived of as an end product, okay? Yeah. And I could never be successful. I know everybody in the business and everyone's a charity. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's they're all not for profit deals. Right, nobody right. nobody can pay the light bill. Yeah. I guess what I was saying, what, what I loved about it was you think it's about planes, but it's better, it's greater than that. 
Yeah, and so in you know the, what I mean. In, so in the past, where people perceived fantasy of flight as about airplanes, and the airplanes were perceived of as the end product, in the future, they're just going to be set dressing. They're part yeah, of telling yeah, yeah. a story, uh, and we're just going to use aviation stories not to teach history, but to use history to teach people about themselves. That's right. Yes, I, I just love the analogy because I think even people who wanted to fly was about going beyond. I mean, exactly. it's like the, the, the actual catalyst is almost a corpse of the internal journey. You know, the planes aren't really the, the end product. No. It's just no. part of the journey, right? Exactly. And, and uh, it's, it's interesting. It's all, it's, and it's really all about the journey, which is kind of one of the signs that we have around here, you know. And, and, uh, and it's interesting, too. I knew a long time ago, uh, before I even hooked up with you guys, that everything that the, the big boys around me do create characters, park icon characters, and stuff like that, you know, you know, sp specifically Walt, I knew I needed to create my own, like, Mickey Mouse kind of character. Yeah, yeah. And so I've written a couple of children's books. My fourth one's at the printer right now. I've created my, uh, you know, my park icon character, which is Austin the Ostrich, okay? And the metaphor being, you know, we see reality uh, from a limited perspective, so we all at some level have our heads in the ground. <laughs> but each of us, you know, we look at our wings and we go, hey, I'm a bird, I have the potential to fly. Right. And so, so there's, there's that dichotomy of uh, seeing reality from a limited perspective, but at the same time we have the potential to go beyond what we perceive ourselves. And happen to, happens to be my four-year-old daughter's favorite book. Oh yeah, so, no yeah, way. Good, yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah. Well, let's move around a little bit. It would be good to see the, the, the planes yeah. behind us, that would okay. be nice. This is the biggest hangar we've got. This is actually the biggest free span uh, building in Polk County, believe it or not. Unbelievable. 200 feet. But uh, we built this uh, open in 1995. Um, a lot of the airplanes, uh, you know, we've got in here have uh, flown. I've flown them. The big one in the behind here, we flew across the Atlantic. Uh, that's the last four-engine passenger flying boat across a major ocean. Yeah, incredible. You know, I think what, what I envision for the uh, Act 3 over there is we'll build some more hangars and we'll basically, you know, we're going to do everything, period. So, like some of the theme parks have different areas, yeah, okay? Yeah, zones, right? Theme well, zones, right? At Fantasy of Flight, what we're going to do in the long run is going to be in the different zones. So, we'll do the Pioneer, the early flight period, kind of from the hang gliders up to the beginning of World War I. We'll have a little World War I airfield. Yeah, so, that'll be one defined zone, yep. A couple of areas to maybe early and late golden age, so you've kind of got the 20s and then up to the mid 30s, and then this whole area here looks like kind of like World War II. Right. And one of the things that we did uh, to really kind of diffuse that World War II, World War yeah. One deal yeah. is uh, basically came up with a deal to to basically say you know positive lessons from negative circumstances mm -hmm. to diffuse that. And I think that's a good thing because. Guess I, that's the case. It's the truth. In, in, every, <laughs> in everyone's life, some of the worst circumstances are the most memorable and they have the most meaning and messages. And for growth, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Uh, one of the things I think that would be important to understand is where. Where is Fantasy of Flight? Maybe you could talk a little bit about its location. Well, as far as location, um, we're exactly halfway between Tampa and Orlando, and it's kind of interesting because had I not Life landed me specifically at this intersection. I never would have coined the name Orlampa. And uh, you know, when I, I when <laughs> I, I bought it. the original property, it was 200 acres is kind of what Fantasy of Flight's built on. We've got our own runways, you know, and I've got lake access to fly vintage seaplanes. Beautiful site. And yeah. uh, you know, we're we've got a nice intersection. You know, when I first moved here, I literally found myself in the middle of nowhere, and now I find myself in the middle of everything. Everything. <laughs> but but I think if we can create something that stands out. Uh, is very, very unique. Um, I think we'll get, uh, like I said, if we're only trying to get 300,000 people a year for the first round of this thing, um, I think uh, already we're central for us, what, 70, 70 million people a year looking for yeah. something new to Number do. Number one destination right. in the world. Right. Over 75 million, 70, over 74 million last year. Oh my God. Incredible. I, I think in 10 years it's gonna be <laughs> over 100 million. Unbelievable, yeah. So, so there's definitely potential here if we can create something that people want to come and see. Yeah, incredible. Wow, what an amazing experience. Thank you for allowing us to tour your facility and giving some insight to our listeners about Panacea Flight. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, uh, this experience here and, and maybe a closeout if you can. Well, it's interesting. I think what we want to do is, like I said, we want to use history, not to teach history, but to teach people about themselves. And I think at the current state of where we are here in Act 3, 
This is pretty much where we're at right now. We're standing in front of a 1910 Curtis Pusher, and this is kind of fantasy of flight in its pioneer days. And behind me is one of the giant 800-pound gorilla theme parks that's, uh, <laughs> that's in the local area. And uh, it was interesting, um, when, I, when, I first met, uh, when I first met Bob up at the SCAD conference, <laughs> up there in Savannah. It was this, Bob has been in this business for a very long time. It was his only second SAIT conference. It was my second SAIT conference. We drove up there, we bumped into each other, and I'll never forget at the end of the deal, they were doing all the wind up at the thing and they were asking for questions. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the end of the deal, uh, you know, the theme of that conference was what's next. And I was the last guy to stand up and I made it a point to stand up because I knew they were filming this and I said, it's interesting, you know, all we've been talking about this whole conference here is what's next in the industry. My question is, what's the next industry? They deflected my question <laughs> and they said, well, the kids out there, because the students at SCAD, right, right. it was the it first was time about ever the, about the students who were there and the that's why trust. Bob went there. Right. And so they deflected my question. And so at the end, I turned around, Bob was sitting up the other, end. I walked up to him, I said, Bob, are you ready to start the next industry? And Bob said, Let's yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, with that, we'll leave. And thank you so much, Lisa, for coming Thanks, out. Kermit. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah, Bob, appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Good Bob. deal. This is going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. You know, I, I got to add one last thing, because oftentimes, you know, you're at a dinner party somewhere or whatever, and around the table you ask, so who's been the most inspirational person uh, in your life? And for me, it's Kermit. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Bob. Uh, because he truly has put me on a path of transformation that has enriched my life, um, has empowered me to believe in myself, mm. and it's so cool to play with him. No but, you doubt. Know, I mean, and, and and so that's why I like to get my pals involved. Yeah, because I want to yeah. share the wealth. Of course, but. All and you've you, obviously you, inspired our whole studio yeah, so, all, and, well, and, and, to grow. And, and, and what I was, what I forgot to say early on, I never finished closed the loop on that. Is basically in the process of of having other people self discover themselves in this design process. We're going to self discover ourselves for ourselves. That's what's so cool, That's, Bob. You just I, 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 perfectly yeah. describe no, it. I, it. It is, and for all of you listening and watching. Um, that's going to be your experience when you come to visit Fantasy of Flight. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that was awesome, man. Oh, yeah, what a nice closure there. <laughs> that's awesome.